thank you so much for coming, and thank you for supporting the Sith Maritime Heritage Society. Perfect. Right there, Becca. I learned long ago when I was training for the U.S. Coast Guard, if the lights are too dim, then when I throw out my candy, which I'm not doing tonight, sorry, I occasionally wake someone up. So um, we, we don't want them too dark, right? Okay, so um, let's start talking about murder. Um, if I can get this thing to work. Yeah, there it goes. Okay, so Ed and I started researching uh, historic true crime about five years ago when we both retired. We started doing sort of an overview of um, murder in Juneau, specifically between the period of around 1900 and 1959 or 1960 when we became a state. And in doing that, um, we ended up creating walking tours for downtown, and this is a photo from one of those tours. So we do walking tours in downtown Juneau, and we just started last year doing one in downtown Douglas. I don't know if anybody's been in downtown Douglas, but it's a happening place. Yeah. There's both a bar and a hair salon. No said. So um, there's okay. There's also a really good hamburger joint. So so um, it's it's been super fun for us, and they were really well received. We do them as volunteers for the Juno City, Juno Douglas City Museum, um, and we do events like this as volunteers for different organizations. We have um, offered presentations again for the City Museum in Juneau. We've also done them for church fundraisers at our physical church in downtown Juneau. And we're really excited about being able to branch out to sit and, and do this over here. So thanks again to the Maritime Society for hosting this event. Um, we are both former newspaper reporters. We actually met covering the same assembly meeting. It was a very romantic setting. And, um, and again, lights were way on. Lots of people in the room, but he was awfully cute. So, so um, I, I continued working as a reporter for about 12 years, both here and in Juneau. Ed spent his entire professional life in the media, both working as a newspaper reporter and editor, and then returning to where he had started in his roots of public radio. Um, so he, when he retired, he retired with this entire catalog of stories that he'd covered over the years. And our initial plan doing tours was to talk about some of these stories that he'd covered, and it turned out to be just not work at all. There were too many people who knew too much who were trying to come to our tours, and they would say things like, um, that that defendant was my first grade in my first grade class, and, and I served on that jury, and it just got too much. So we dropped anybody who wouldn't be dead anyway, and are just sticking to historic crime. Um, so this particular story is a really safe bet because, again, it happened in 1920. Um, so we're, we're pretty comfortable that we're not going to know anybody. Um, I want to point out this newspaper advertisement because it, it references the victim, whose name was um, Billy Woodworth. And we know Billy Woodworth through advertisements like this, a few newspaper articles, and absolutely no photographs. Um, but we're going to be talking about the murder here in a few minutes. I want to talk for a second about where we get our information. We rely on newspapers. That's, that was where we started our professional lives, and that's where almost all this information comes from because nobody else was gathering the information. People weren't writing books about it. People weren't writing news articles about it. We weren't even in true crime magazines with two notable exceptions that happened years after 1920. So um, chroniclingamerica.com is the Library of Congress website that has digitized newspapers from around the country. And you can actually search their ar archives. You don't need a password. You don't need a username. You can just get on their website. And you can search for a particular word, so a family name, um, a, a place in a place in the country. There, it's just a great, great site. I can't say enough good things about it. And we also relied heavily in this particular case on my friend Gregory. Um, it's kind of embarrassing when you become friends with an archivist for a federal penitentiary. But he is, turns out to just be a great guy, and he's been super helpful, and has really gone overboard. Little maritime his, history joke. He's really he's been really really helpful, giving giving us information about things I wouldn't have even asked for him. So when I first started working with him, I think it was on this case, he sent me an entire spreadsheet of everybody who'd come out of Alaska and had gone to Leavenworth, which was super helpful, as it turns out. Right? Do you think they're wouldn't be that many people. Well, there were. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk more about that here in a minute. Um, 
So th that's where we found out about this stuff. When we start looking at any story, the first thing we want to do is define the setting in which this story occurred, because that setting is going to tell us so much about why things happened the way they did. And Ed is our expert on the setting, so he's going to introduce us to Southeast Alaska in 1920. I'm not really sure if I need a microphone, but uh, I'll use it since it's here. Anyway, uh, in 1920, we'll start with a few steps back. Alaska as a whole had 55,000 residents. That was about a 50th of today's population, which is almost three quarters of a million people. Of course, that depends on whether it's summer or winter or tourist season or not, but it's around there. Uh, statewide, um, in 1920, Alaska Natives made up about half the territory's population, and that's actually less than half the number before contact with first the Russians and the British and the Americans and others who brought smallpox and other diseases indigenous people had little or no resistance to at the time. In 1920, Southeast as a region had about 17,400 residents, a little less than a third of Alaska's total population. Of course, these days, Southeast has I think less than 10% of Alaska's population. Um, the biggest city in Southeast, as it is now, was Juneau, which had uh, close to 5,000 people, 4,700. Ketchikan had 2,500, and Sitka had about 1,200 people. The rest of the residents of Southeast lived in smaller towns and villages, many of them <laughs> inner, near canneries. And if you do research on Sitka's population, I don't know why anybody would, but I did, there's also uh, census figures out there that show Sitka as having about 2,400 residents, just a little smaller than Ketchikan, but that includes Angoon and Yakutat and Teneke and I think a couple other places. So Sitka proper was about 1,200. By the way, this map, um, I don't expect anybody to be able to read any of the words on it, but uh, along with the geographical names, almost all the place names are where canneries are. Uh, you can see right here it says cannery, so I guess they didn't know what that name was, but I don't expect any people to <laughs> be able to see that. So Southeast Alaska in the teens. Um, the 1920 population here was actually a 14% drop from 1910. Why? Well, a lot of men had uh, left Alaska, Southeast and elsewhere uh, during the late teens, mid to late teens, to fight in World War I. There were also a lot of wartime industries uh, that uh, did well. People wanted to help the war effort, and they also uh, wanted to make more money than maybe they could make in a small town. Uh, then there was the flu epidemic. The flu epidemic, worldwide flu epidemic, known as Spanish flu, even though it probably didn't originate in, in Spain, uh, took the lives of close to 12,000 Alaskans. That's a heck of a lot of people. Uh, and it particularly decimated Alaska native populations, again, um, because of a uh, lack of exposure earlier. Uh, pretty sad. The region's economy also changed during the 19-teens leading up to 1920. A lot of small-scale gold miners, gold panners, folks looking for nuggets or having small tunnels, small uh, adits in the mountains and such, uh, really made way to the larger industrialized uh, mine operations that employed hundreds if not thousands of people and generally were owned and financed outside Alaska. Not all of them, but a lot. So Sitka at this time was very much a fish town. The fishermen and processors, um, I was reading an article today by uh, Rebecca Polson uh, when I was doing a little research and I think you said there were eight regular boat builders in town. Um, you don't have to remember everything you've ever wrote. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> but, but anyway, there no, but there were anyway. There was a lot of boat building going on here. Um, so it was a time when um, it, it would, for Sitka it had been about 20 years since the capital had moved to Juneau, and it was uh, a <coughs> couple decades before World War II, which saw a lot of build up of population here, along with people leaving to serve in the war and way before the pulp mills, although I'm sure there was a small mill of some sort here. So the canneries, the canneries and the canneries were really picking up and growing in southeast. Um, excuse me. 
<clears throat> the first two canneries in Alaska, one was in Sitka and the other was in Kowak, <coughs> according to our research, was built in the late uh, 1870s. So this is quite a, this 50 years before the era we're talking about. And they were, like so many Alaska businesses, owned by San Francisco-based companies. A decade later, there were close to 40 canneries in operation, some small, some pretty big. In the 19-teens, expansion continued with many of the fish coming from traps, which were later outlawed, as you probably know. And during the First World War, the federal government took over many of the canneries, collecting about half their out output to feed the troops. Uh, closer to 1920, about 30 canneries were built or bought um, uh, in Southeast. So it was continued growth, and it continued for a while. Um, one of the things about the canneries was they depended on low-wage workers they brought in from other countries, particularly the Pacific Islands and Asia. The companies that owned the canneries actively recruited, recruited workers from China, Japan, and the Philippines, and the makeup of the workforce depended on the year. For example, in 1912, about 3,000 workers were brought over from Japan. Working conditions varied, but overall, Asian and Pacific Island immigrants had very little control over their lives, uh, even once they got on the boat on the way up here. Uh, some workers were never paid at the end of the season. Others left Alaska in debt due to a, to a contractor, due to losing their earnings in contractor-run uh, gambling rackets, and there was a lot of gambling. <coughs> Cannery workers were forced to purchase unnecessary uh, goods, like fine suits at elevated prices from the company stores or the contractors. <coughs> Moreover, the only work that was made available for Asian American and Pacific Island cannery workers, at least in the early days, was in the fish house, basically the slime line, the dirty work. Fishing jobs, mechanical work, beach gang employment was reserved mostly for white workers and to a lesser extent Alaska natives. But there were still good reasons to take the jobs. According to Margaret Thomas, who's a former Alaska reporter who wrote a book about cannery organizing, quote, for those on the lowest rung of cannery life, the Alaska fishing season offered a half year of room and board and a temporary escape from West Coast labor antagonists. There were a lot of other jobs, canneries, and other jobs up and down the West Coast that also recruited the same groups of people. Immigration restrictions and other factors that decade decreased the number of Chinese and Japanese workers and increased the Filipino workforce, whose Thomas's book says were more successful uh, in organizing for better working conditions, but that didn't happen at 1920, that was later. Well, why did the companies not want organizing? Um, obviously, uh, they didn't want people to strike to make more money or have better working conditions. And in fact, to prevent organizing, they would um, house people in uh, by ethnic group, racial group, uh, and isolated from each other, separate cooks, separate dining halls. Um, and they, plus white and cannery workers, largely had to entertain themselves. Gambling, as I mentioned before, was very popular at the canneries. It was encouraged by the shipping companies bringing people to Alaska, as well as the cannery managers. That's because the owners took, on an average, a quarter of the take. So what did people do in these times other than gamble? Well, there was a lot of prostitution. It was very common at the canneries in the cities. Uh, for example, Ketchikan's red light district along Creek Street, which is shown in this historic photo, um, had at least 21 brothels with no fewer than 37 prostitutes in 1920. Uh, now that is now a tourist attraction that celebrates its body pass to a certain extent. There's a museum and uh, one of the places called Dolly's House, and I stayed at a place on Creek Street once and was looking for, you know, everybody always has a little sign talking about the history, you know, in, in tourist lodging, uh, saying what it had been used for, but somehow or other that had disappeared. <coughs> well, um, the, uh, for the canneries, uh, there were floating brothels that brought women and sometimes men to isolated canneries. One company actively recruited transgender men Alcohol was also a big part of the scene. Despite Alaska's bone dry law, which was a prohibition measure that took effect in 1918, that was two years before the constitutional amendment that banned booze nationwide. But the bone dry law and nationwide prohibition, um, well, bone dry law stayed on the books until the 30s, never stopped the flow of alcohol. Plenty could be found in the cities, the towns, and especially 
the canneries where there was very little uh, uh, government oversight. Movies were popular, especially in the cities, but there were uh, folks who took movies out to the canneries in the small towns. Um, the films were silent. Sound wasn't added until the late 20s. I, don't, I haven't been able to find out when the first sound uh, movie made it to Alaska, but uh, it certainly wasn't in 1920. It was later. Musicians would provide a live soundtrack, and it could come from a small orchestra or a single player on the piano or sometimes the guitar. Uh, it was basically mood music, and how well the mood matched the film depended on the sobriety of the musician. Uh, some places, including at the theater in Sitka, uh, they often just played 78 RPM records. I hope everybody here remembers 78 RPM records. They went very, 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 very fast, and the ones that are still around are very scratchy and kind of rare items these days. Uh, Bob DeArmond, the historian who lived here as well as in Juneau, uh, wrote an essay quite a few years ago about a Sitka theater where everybody wanted the theater to play Red Wing, which is an old string band too. No matter if it was a romance, if it was an adventure, if it was a war silent film, a western, they wanted to hear Red Wing. To the point that the owner got so sick of it, he broke the record in half. <laughs> well, not long after that, maybe the next day, somebody presented him with a new copy of the record, and he was warned what would happen to him if he broke that one. <laughs> one of the most region's most popular performers was a man named Billy Woodworth uh, during this period of time, and I'm going to hand this over to Betsy. Thank you. <clears throat> So we don't know what Billy Woodworth looked like. We know that he had brown hair and blue eyes. We don't know his age. Well, we have an idea about that. I'll t tell you about that later. But we know he showed up for the first time, at least according to the newspaper, in 1913, where he was performing in blackface in Juneau. He was actually sort of well known for performing in blackface, which seems incredibly repellent right now, but was not unusual at all at the time. Um, he pretty much did anything he could to make a living as a performer. So um, I, I did a lot of research on him and found uh, a number of different places where he talks about what his um, occupation was, as well as these newspaper advertisements that we found. Uh, as I mentioned, 19, 1913, he showed up in blackface. Um, on passenger manifest, seven times between March of 1913 and May 1916, he describes coming up as a musician. He describes coming up as a cameraman. Um, he also changed his age. Although he started at 39, he progressively became younger as the years went on. <laughs> so somewhere, he generally gave his age as somewhere between 29 and 39, never older than 39. Um, in 1916, the newspaper noted that he was playing the piano every night in Juneau at the Grand, wherever that was. And also that year, he was noted as going to be filming a, a film about the 4th of July in Juneau. In 1917, he was apparently a cameraman for a film on a military training corps in Juneau. And in 1918, he registered for the draft as the owner of the premier Alaska film company, stating he was 39. Um, so he, this is a man who basically is doing whatever he can to make a living in performing. Um, and um, he made a living well enough, he said, to spend his winters in Seattle and his summers in Southeast Alaska. He, he, um, let's see if I can get this thing to move forward. Oh, here we go. Um, he actually performed to lots of different places um, outside of just Juneau. He, we know he performed in Ketchikan, Cordoba, Skagway, Anchorage. Um, and uh, even, we're sure, Sitka. But um, in 1915, in his anxiety to make a name for himself, he made up a story. And um, this story was, he, so this, the first appearance is he's leaving Juneau in a small gas boat that he's named the Alaska to go down to San Francisco for the World Fair. Um, and um, people warn him that boat's pretty small, it's probably not the smartest thing to do, but he proceeds. Makes his way to Seattle, I don't know if he ever went any further. And in Seattle, he decides to tell the newspaper this <coughs> fabulous story about how there was an incredible storm, and it, it swept one of the men on his boat overboard, and the guy died. 
And this was a this was a pretty big deal for the Seattle newspaper. It fed all the myths that we still have about Alaska being a dangerous place and you take your life in your hands. And so there was a front page article about this man identifying him as having been killed in this dreadful boating accident and how the other people barely made it alive to Seattle. Well, um, back in Juneau where this story appeared pretty darn quickly, the man who was supposedly dead was surprised to see that he was dead because he'd never gotten on that boat. He had been wise enough to stay in Juneau. His friends and family were not so happy about this, and they actually asked a federal marshal to go talk to Billy Woodworth, who was still down in Seattle, which he obligingly did. And he, as you note from this article, told the, told the federal marshal that he'd only been, quote, kidding the reporter at the Post Intelligencer. He, there wasn't any ramifications to that. Even the newspaper in Juneau just sort of saw this as sort of a funny story about this performer instead of any sort of condemnatory uh, response. And I think it goes to show that people probably weren't taking Billy Woodworth very seriously about much of anything. Um, but as I said, he kept performing. In 1919, he started, I think, this sort of odd performance that he titled Over There, where he directed a veteran from um, Canadian Armed Forces who had returned and would perform different episodes from his time at the battlefront. I, I can't imagine what that looked like. I do know, according to reviews in the paper, somebody referred to it simply as being a, awfully long. <laughs> that was as much as we could see. And eventually segued into the two of them performing in, quote, comedy, music, and song, and apparently they would just dance and sing. Um, but also around that same period, Billy decided to take on a whole new endeavor. Oh, sorry, backward. Okay, here we go. He started doing what Ed was talking about, boats going from cannery town to cannery town, and he uh, would lease boats, he did this for two years, lease boats for the summer, and traveled all these many little cannery towns and fishing villages and even whale, whaling research places and whaling, boat, whaling communities. Um, and he had a movie projector with him and he would have two or three people with him who would perform music and um, dance and the side business was they always had alcohol on board. Um, which was interesting to me because when I went through court records I could find different incidences of boats being searched for contraband alcohol but his boats were never among them. In 1920, the boat that he'd been using all that summer was called the Sea Breeze, and he was leasing it um, from a man who ran a famous speakeasy down in Ketchikan, and I suspect was providing that contraband alcohol. So he'd been doing quite well. He told, he told somebody that on one trip alone, he'd made about $1,200, which in today's dollars would be about 18000 so this was a profitable way for him to make a living. Um, there was also some allegations that on occasion he carried female prostitutes on board. But on this particular, um, this particular trip, that is not what happened. He had two people on his boat in 1920 who were supposedly helping out. One was this man, E.C. Lilly, Edward Constant Lilly. Edward had been born in West Virginia, but was actually raised in a place called Bohemia, Oregon. Um, and he was a guitar player. Um, supposedly, he was also part of the crew on this boat. And, um, and he, again, supposedly wrote songs. What we don't know is whether Woodworth, who had hired him, knew that he was also um, a convicted of both manslaughter and theft out of California and had served time in Folsom Prison. Um, what what the little bit more we know about him is that shortly before he came up to Alaska, just a couple years before, and he came up to Alaska that year, he'd been married. He had been married and had one child, a boy he named Shirley. Um, he had left Shirley and his mother behind when he came up to Alaska. We don't know if there was any ever again any communication between the two of them. Um, he was 31 at the time he came up here. Um, in 1917, he had list, 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 listed on his draft card that he was a minor, but in the 1920 census, which would have been earlier in this year, the same year, he said he was a bus driver for a hotel in California, and that's how we know he had not been in Alaska for very long, probably just for that summer season. 
What we also know is that he had served time at Folsom. Um, when he was 17 years old, um, Constant, as he was then called, um, was working at a dairy in California. It was probably part of some sort of reformatory act for youth in trouble because um, he, he was known to be, had to, had to work there because he'd gotten in some sort of trouble. And on um, one of the days he was there, he got into a physical argument with another a young boy, uh, another kid working there whose name was Alexander Gonzalez. The next day he returned to work carrying a gun after this argument with Gonzalez and shot and killed Gonzalez. Um, he said it was self-defense and that Gonzalez had attacked him with a milking stool. Um, and as I mentioned, he was 17 when he was arrested. He was 18 the day that the jury uh, sentenced him. Actually, the jury convicted him. But instead of convicting him of first-degree murder, the newspapers of the time said they gave him a birthday present of a manslaughter conviction. Because this seems like a fairly clear-cut first-degree murder charge. This is somebody who's had a fight with a guy the day before and comes back with a weapon. Um, but instead of convicting him of first-degree murder, they gave him a conviction of manslaughter, and he was sentenced to 10 years at Folsom. He got out in seven, um, and within a year or two was back in Folsom for theft. And again, he served just a portion of the sentence that he received, that time a years-long sentence. So this, this is um, E.C. Lilly, who's made his way now up to Alaska and is working on board the Sea Breeze with Billy Woodworth, along with a third man, and he was referred to in the newspapers at the time as E.S. Jack. Now, this, this deal with initials was very, very common for the time. Um, we, we've come across a number of people who we only ever knew by their initials, and this was one of those names because I could find no evidence of an E.S. Jack in any of the research that I did about Alaska. I couldn't find him in census. I couldn't find him in any sort of a Ketchikan record, so we know he was living in Ketchikan. Um, during the, the ensuing trial, there was a witness who said that Jack's real name was Chomley. Uh, but again, I had no luck looking for Chomley either. I suspect he was one of the many men, and occasionally women, who would show up in Alaska having left behind something they really didn't want to have anything more to do with, a family, a job, maybe a military history. Um, and in this case, like so, with so many other men, um, he was never heard from again by his family. So um, now we, this is set, the setting. We have these three men on board this leased boat traveling around southeast Alaska. And Ed's going to tell us what happens next. Finally, we get to the meat of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Although we know you're all history buffs, right? <laughs> Maritime history buffs. Anyway, on August 25th, 1920, Captain Carl William Harrington, who turns out to be a rather sharp gentleman, was sailing a cannery tender, the Lumi Bay, uh, through the waters of Frederick Sound on its way to Chatham Strait. It was a 70-foot long gas boat, and as most of you probably know, there were also a lot of sailing boats, uh, fishing boats, but at this time, in everything you read, people were very always clear in their writing whether it was a gas boat or a sailing boat. Almost everything at this point was a gas boat that we came across. Now, there are no photos we could find um, of the Lumi Bay. Uh, this is the Trojan, but it was a similar vessel. Uh, this probably is a little smaller. The Lumi Bay, along with being a cannery tender, um, was a mailboat for a number of small towns and canneries in the area, and Harrington knew them well. His route that day was from Saginaw Bay on the northern tip of QU Island to Port Walter on the southeast side of Baranoff Island. Um, and if you look at this map, uh, it's Murder Cove Tai is sort of below, um, sort of lower middle, a little bit to the left, uh, which is near where the crime took place. It's actually only about 40, maybe a little more miles um, east of Sitka, which is the tiniest liter little lettering in this map. I don't know why. But anyway, that's the way it was. Um, so, um, Harrington hadn't traveled very far on his route that day when around 5.15 p.m. his cook, the cook on his boat, approached him with some urgent news. He had seen what he thought was a burning boat in the distance. 
So Harrington, who had been eating his supper, put down his plate and silverware, probably his bottle of whiskey, and changed direction and headed the Lumi Bay about a dozen miles to the north. He soon recognized the burning boat as the Sea Breeze, uh, an eight-ton, 35-foot gas fishing boat. He knew it carried a trio, sometimes a quartet of actors and singers, who had put on shows in small towns and canneries around southern southeast. Harrington later said, uh, that he thought the blaze was just starting because he could see it reflected in the doomed boat's windows, uh, so it was inside. Um, it hadn't spread outside the vessel's interior, at least yet. It took about 25 minutes for the Lumi Bay to cover the distance between the two boats. And uh, you can see a little closer here, uh, Murder Cove, a little above the middle, and uh, Yasha Island, uh, just below that, the star there, um, and that's about where uh, this was all happening. Uh, Yasha Island uh, was on the southern tip, off the southern tip of Admiralty Island. Uh, the cove's name comes from the 1869 killing of two prospectors in retaliation for the murder of two Clinkett tribesmen. That led the U.S. Navy, which tended to overreact, especially when they wanted to put down what they thought were native rebellions. Uh, a U.S. Navy boat shelled and destroyed three villages and two wooden forts near present-day Cake. I'm sure they killed a lot of people or, or led people to starvation. Harrington circled the, build, the burning boat and he looked for signs of life, but he saw no one on board and no one in the water. He checked the surrounding area with his field glasses and spotted a black dot on the horizon. It was a boat about two miles away to the east. A man was on board rowing very strongly but he was not headed to the nearest port, which would have been Taiyi, the fish processing plant and whaling station near Murder Cove. And that's the Taiyi plant when it was a whaling station. Um, you can see the whales out in front. It later became uh, a herring reduction plant, and that's what it was at the time uh, of, of this incident. Well, it took the Lumi Bay more than 10 minutes to catch up with the rowboat, which kept rowing away until it was clear it would be overtaken. The Lumi Bay pulled alongside and brought its occupant on board. Harrington began questioning the rower, who identified himself as E.C. Lilly, one of the entertainers for the Sea Breeze. He appeared to be drunk, though Harrington found no alcohol on board the rowboat. The Alaska Dispatch newspaper, which was based in Juneau, but covered news throughout southeast Alaska, as well as some issues up north. Uh, it later wrote that Harrington told officials the following. I asked this fellow where he was going. He said he didn't know. I asked him if he was from the boat that was a set of fire, and he said yes. I asked how he got so far away and all alone in such a short time if he left when the boat had just started a fire. He answered he was in a hurry to get away. I asked him where the rest of the crew was, and he said one man was on the boat and pointed to the fire. I asked him if he tried to help or save this man on the boat, and he said no. Well, after picking up Lily in the rowboat, Harrington motored back to where the sea breeze was burning. He and his crew arrived just as it broke in two and sank in deep water. Of course, there was no way to recover the boat in those days. It would have been pretty hard these days. Lily had told him the fire began when the gas tanks on the boat exploded, but Captain Harrington and his crew could very clearly see that all three gas tanks were floating in the water after the boat sank. <laughs> So, word got around, and there were headlines like this one. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Lily s seemed very unconcerned about Woodworth. In fact, he admitted doing virtually nothing to rescue him from the fire and get him on the rowboat. Harrington thought this suspicious and began questioning Lily in more detail. After he was sure there were no other survivors, Harrington headed southwest to Port Walter on the east coast of Baranoff Island where Lily was left to make his way back to Ketchikan before he could even take the, take the next mail boat to the closest large town, which would have been Petersburg, an investigator arrived from Juneau and detained him and formally arrested him. Uh, there's Port Walter. Um, along the way, Harrington continued pushing Lily on the matter of the other entertainers. At first, Lily claimed the third member of the troop, E.S. Jack or Chomley, as Betsy told you, or probably some other name we don't know, stayed behind at their last stop, which was Fort Alexander at the southern tip of Baranoff Island. But he changed that story. He said Jack and Woodworth had a big argument that almost came to blows. According to this story, Jack hailed a passing trawler and sailed off in another direction. 
Lilly also said the Sea Breeze's engine broke down at about 5 p.m. the evening that it sank. He said he was at the wheel in the pilot house when he began smelling gas, then smoke. According to his story, Woodworth went below deck to work on the engine while Lilly remained at the wheel. Lilly said that after about 30 minutes, he looked for the troop leader and called to him two or three times but got no response. Lilly told Harrington he realized the boat was on fire and in trouble, so he grabbed some possessions from his bunk plus some provisions and threw them onto the back <coughs> of the deck. The rowboat was being towed behind the sea breeze, so Lilly pulled it alongside, loaded it up with as much as he could. Lilly said that the fire was burning so hot that his face was scorched, but Harrington saw no such injury. And this was just a few, uh, an hour or two or three after that would have happened. It would have been obvious. Lilly also said he had taken only two or three or four seconds to gather up his possessions. When given the opportunity by Harrington to correct that to three or four minutes, he insisted it was seconds. Well, Harrington knew that was impossible and a big fat lie. When he picked up Lily, he inventoried what was in his rowboat. He found Lily's guitar, his luggage, a couple pieces of it, an oil skin coat, canned salmon, canned milk, bread, a brush and a comb, a new galvanized pail, and Lily's favorite photo of himself. <laughs> Harrington also found a Luger revolver underneath the seat. Lily admitted that he had taken no other action to locate or rescue Woodworth. Harrington suggested he could have helped the troop leader get out through the, a forward skylight or hatch, but Lily said it was latched from the inside, not that he had checked. He said he didn't try to break it open or do anything else to help Woodworth because he was afraid of an explosion and wanted to get away. But he denied any animosity between himself and Woodworth. Lily said they just got along fine, but he seemed to show no concern about his fate. After his arrest in Port Walter, Lily was taken aboard another mailboat uh, to Petersburg and then on to the territorial capital where he was jailed. And uh, Betsy will take over in just a moment, but uh, we're having a few spots in this presentation where we're taking questions or you can just hold them to the end. Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, that's fine. Want to find out what happened next. What yeah. happened next? What happened next? Because <laughs> we're so fascinating. Yeah, we're so fascinating. So um, when he was arrested in Juneau, one of the first things they did was search him. And when they searched him, this man who had told Harrington he had barely enough money to get a steamship out of Ketchikan back down to uh, the lower 48, they discovered he had a whole lot of cash on him. Um, he said one of the few truthful things I think he said it, which is it wasn't his money. It was Woodworth and Chomley's money. But he didn't ex explain why it was he had it. He just had it. Um, so initially, the newspaper said they were considering charging him with theft or larceny. Um, but the, by the next day, however, they had, the newspaper reported they hadn't charged him with theft. They charged him with first-degree murder. Um, and this happened on September 1st. The crime was August 25th, and I want you to keep an eye on these dates because things are happening very, very fast. Um, sorry, not that fast. So, um, so he, he ends up being indicted on the 11th, and while he's being investigated, I want to tell you about who investigated him because this was really interesting to me. It's one of the few times in these days that I saw the investigation was not being done by the federal marshals or the police. It was being done by what they called the Bureau of Investigation of the United States Government, which was actually the precursor to the FBI. And it had been created just um, a few years before this in 1908. They had one detective in Alaska, and that person's office was in Juneau. So my guess is because the geographic distribution of this particular murder didn't happen in, in Juneau, so the federal marshals there wouldn't be responsible for it. They assigned it instead to this, um, this bureau, this newly formed bureau. And um, they relied heavily on in interviews with Lily, who continued to deny any connection with any death, continued to state that uh, Chomley or Jack was not aboard the Sea Breeze at the time it caught fire. And um, mention, as Ed said, that he didn't make any effort to help Woodworth because he was, quote, in a hurry to get away. Um, there were other witnesses that this investigator talked to. Among other things they did was they sent out a federal deputy marshal to uh, talk to fishing boats 
and to different courts in the area to try to track down the third man, Chomley or Jack, with no luck. He was, had, was never seen again. Um, they also talked to people who had seen the three men leave their last port, and they all agreed that while occasionally they carried other people on board the boat, including prostitutes, when it had left its last port, those three men were the only ones on board. Um, so that's what they know at the time that they were indicted. It went to trial, believe it or not, October 4th. So um, he's He's been indicted on September 11th. It's now a trial, which is, even in those days, remarkably speedy. Um, the prosecutor decided to take on the, the prosecution himself, which was a little unusual. Usually, Smicer would have deputy prosecutors take on cases. My guess, he saw this as a slam dunk. There was no way he could possibly be embarrassed with the prosecution of this case. So he was happy to take it on. The defense attorney, J.B. Marshall, was almost certainly appointed. I couldn't find proof of that, but that would I believe that was probably the case because once his money had been taken from him, he would have been indigent. Um, Marshall went on to become a very well-known lawyer in Juneau, and in fact, it's still his home that he built downtown Juneau is, is a well-known historic home in Juneau. But at this point, I think he was probably relatively young and new in the job. The most important witness, not surprisingly, was Captain Harrington. Harrington had an excellent reputation. He'd been a skipper for a long time, and as a mailboat skipper, he knew lots of people, and they knew and respected him. So his description of events would have been absolutely damning um, to, to Lily, um, especially in a maritime setting where everybody who's ever been on a boat knows better than to desert your fellow um, people on a boat and just row off in the only lifeboat, leaving them behind and taking your favorite photograph of yourself. Um, there were also a number of uh, prosecution witnesses who talked about how very angry Lily was at Woodworth. Um, you'll note that, that the bullet says there was no defense opening statement. Marshall seems to have relied on um, Lily's idea that because there was no physical evidence, and I have to tell you, especially in those days, physical evidence was crucial in a con successful conviction, and there was absolutely none. The boat was sunk, the bodies were gone, this was, would be a very difficult thing to prosecute. Except for a really important fact, in 1917, three years before this, there had been a successful prosecution in Juneau for first degree murder of a man who's and the body wasn't in evidence. So there was already precedent in these very early territorial days of a successful prosecution for first degree murder without a body. And even today, a successful prosecution for first degree murder without a body is unusual. It's unusual enough that when Ed and I ended up at CrimeCon in Las Vegas this past year, weird place, um, we actually heard a presentation from a California prosecutor simply on the fact that he had successfully prosecuted two murders that did not involve uh, bodies. and Because it, it's still such an unusual case. So I suspect both Lily and his attorney thought that there was absolutely no case because there was no body. They probably didn't know of the earlier precedent of the very successful prosecution three years before that had result, resulted not only in a conviction, but in a sentence of hanging. Um, so, so there's this precedent already, most likely relying, by the way, on federal maritime law. And that's because everything was federal. We were territory, right? So there wasn't there was a state government. So all the, all the um, statutes, all the law governing this trial would have been federal law. And federal maritime law does allow for prosecution without bodies because, of course, that's going to be a common theme among murders in a maritime setting. So... Um, so, so this, this, was, this was the sort of scene here. We have a person who's saying, um, a defense attorney and a defendant saying, well, you can't show that anything happened, so it must not have happened. And um, a pretty experienced, um, I suspect, judge and certainly prosecutor saying, well, we've done this before, we can do it again. The witnesses that the prosecution called in addition to Harrington included witnesses who said that 
two witnesses who said they had heard um, Lily threaten Woodworth's life. In one case, um, he had been complaining that he was being paid in Canadian money, which wasn't as valuable as American money, and that Woodworth wouldn't put food on the streets. Um, there was also a witness who identified Jack as really named Chomley, and noted that he and Lily had actually shared a cabin in Ketchikan. So if Lily killed Chomley, as we're almost positive he did, he was killing somebody he'd actually shared a cabin with. Um, a witness from Hyder says Lily told him he was having trouble getting paid and, quote, he was going to get his wages or going to get Woodworth. He'd served one term in the pen and could serve another. At that point, Lily's gun had been taken from him in Hyder. It was later returned to him and then taken again in Ketchikan when at the speakeasy where the guy who leased them their boat, he got to another big argument with, with, with Woodworth, again threatened his life, and again had his gun taken away. So at this point, the witnesses are saying the gun that was found on Lily was actually Jack's gun, or Chomley's gun, which is the only physical evidence we have that a Chomley never left the boat, because if he had left the boat, he would have taken his gun with him. Um, so, so Woodworth, by the way, was threat told that Lily was a bad character and he should be careful about him, and he said he wasn't worried. He didn't own a gun. He had no intention of getting one. Um, so what happened? Well, the defense attorney relied completely on the lack of physical evidence in his defense. So at the close of the trial, it, which took two whole days, the defense had called no witnesses and had not done much in the way of rebutting the witnesses. Instead, just asked the judge to throw the whole thing out. There wasn't enough evidence. It couldn't possibly, he couldn't possibly convict it, toss it. The judge said no. Um, it went to the jury after Lilly declined to take the stand on his own behalf, which was probably a wise move because he would almost certainly have lied, which wouldn't have done him any favors. And given some of the things he said to people before, he probably wouldn't have lied very effectively. Um, so the, the judges said, no, we're not going to throw this out. And by the way, I am not going to do the instructed verdict that you're hoping for. So oftentimes, in a, in a, especially in a um, murder trial, the defense attorney will ask the judge to give specific directions to the juror before they send them off to deliberate. And in this case, the defense attorney was asking the judge to tell the jury that there wasn't a case. You can go deliberate if you want, but why bother because there isn't any evidence. And the judge said, thanks, but no thanks. Great advice, I'm not going to do it. So um, it went off to the jury, and um, the jury was out more than five minutes. According to the records I've got, it, they were out for an hour and 45 minutes before they came back with a conviction. Now, this is interesting. Again, in territorial days, it was up to the jury to determine whether the, that con person convicted of first-degree murder would either be hanged or would receive a life in prison. And in this case, probably because of that lack of physical evidence, the jury agreed that he would be sent to uh, prison for life. And so that's exactly what happened. I'm going to read you um, his physical response according to the newspaper. Quote, to a slight degree, Lily lost control of himself as the verdict was being read. And as the pronouncement of guilty was reached, he lost his alert appearance, <coughs> slid forward in his chair, seeming to shrivel for an instant, his nervousness apparent for all. Um, so it wasn't unusual for, ju for juries to come back during territorial days and ask for a life sentence. In fact, in the more than 40 years of territorial rule, there were only 11 times, 12, sorry, 12 times that juries came back and said the person should be hanged and said capital punishment. In one of those cases, and this is actually in the book, and it was the same case I was just talking about, the man who'd been convicted three years before, he escaped from jail before he could be hanged. Um, so that was the, the 12th case. Those 11, the, the 11 other men were, were hanged. And um, just because I can tell you this, I will. <laughs> so one of the things that, that in, happened in 19, so we became a state in 1959, right? Well, in 1957, um, at that point, there had been the most recent hangings had occurred in Juneau. There were two black men who were hanged for the same crime because they really couldn't decide which one of them had done it. Probably neither of them did. 
Um, one of them was hanged in 1948 and the other in 1950. Two uh, territorial legislators, one of whom was Vic Fisher, went to the territorial legislature and said, hey, we've hanged 11 men in the territory um, during the territorial years, and of those 11 men, eight were men who were not white. The vast majority of murderers in the territory have been white men. There's something wrong with this. And consequently, the territorial legislature banned the death penalty. It's never been part of our state constitution, but there are always attempts to bring it back. So I'm kind of proud of us for having banned the death penalty two years before we became a state. Um, so what happened next? Well, what happened next is Lily keeps singing. Uh, the newspaper had referred several times, including to the time when he was being brought up from Petersburg to, to go to jail in Juneau, of his getting his guitar and singing blithely away. And apparently that continued as he was preparing to go off to McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary. The Federal Penitentiary in Mac uh, McNeil Island has sometimes been referred to as the Alcatraz of Washington. It's on an island out of, outside Seattle. It was built during the Civil War era. But it was used as a federal penitentiary until, I think, as recently as 20 or 30 years ago. It then became a state penitentiary for a short time, and it's now closed. Um, so he, all, pretty much everybody coming out of Juneau who was a federal prisoner was sent to McNeil initially. And then they would often be sent to other uh, penitentiaries, depending on their behavior and how long their sentence was. Pretty quickly, um, he was sent to Leavenworth. Lily was sent to Leavenworth. Um, and in Leavenworth, he ends up, let's see if I can find my cheat sheet here. He describes to, um, according to the Leavenworth records, this is how he described what happened to him. He stated that he and two other men owned and operated a launch in coastwise business along the coast of Alaska. He stated that during a storm, the launch caught fire, burned up, and he was the only one who was saved. He stated that at no time during his trial was there any evidence to show that a murder had been committed. Now, when he started at Leavenworth, he would have been under the expectation, based on his previous history in California, that he was not going to be serving his full sentence. And in fact, he was up, could have been up for parole in 1935, again, according to this warden's card from Leavenworth. But, according to my friend Gregory, without an attorney or family advocating for him to get parole, it was very unlikely he would earn it. So he did not. Um, and at age 55, in 1944, he jumped off a walkway in Leavenworth and killed himself. Um, Gregory said that the records indicated very clearly this was not a homicide, it was a suicide. And he's buried at Leavenworth Federal Prison um, cemetery. Ed's now going to tell us a little bit more about our friend Billy. So after the trial ended and Lily was sent off to prison, came news about Woodworth's childhood. We really found nothing in the, in the coverage of this crime or his entertainment about where he was from or how he had gotten to Alaska. One of his sisters had seen newspaper coverage of his death and then of the trial. And she may have been concerned that it presented Woodworth, excuse me, as a man of questionable character, which he was. So she wrote a letter to the Alaska Dispatch, a southeast newspaper that had been in Juneau, but had now moved to Seattle, still covered Alaska for a while. In it, Mrs. Marion Rosine of Des Moines, Iowa, also names two other sisters, Mrs. Alice Bale of Chicago and Nell, no last name, no <coughs> town given, who was married to a preacher. According to Marion, uh, Woodworth's sister, it said Woodworth was raised by Nell, but skipped out and came west when he was 14. It noted the family had called him Will, or Willie the Baby, and he wasn't the only one who was musical. Marion, who wrote the letter, uh, said she also had a reputation as a composer of songs. Like her brother, she also liked attention. It also said that Woodworth had not seen his father, G.C. Woodworth of Madison, Ohio, for decades, but encouraged by another relative, he had traveled to Ohio and visited for a month the winter before his death on the sea breeze. It had been 27 years since he had left home. 
Marion wrote, the terrible news of my brother burning to death and the fact that he had been murdered seems more than I can grasp. She noted her father knew of his son's disappearance, but not how he died. The shock to him of my brother's death has proved almost fatal. There was a little drama in that part of the family, too. There was no mention of a marriage, family, or an entertainment career outside Alaska. And despite Billy Woodward's claims to be only 39 or younger, his sister's letter revealed that he was actually 47 when he died. One thing I should mention before we move on from this is uh, there's been all this reference to him burning to death. We can't prove it, can't prove anything, but our belief is, is that, um, is that uh, sorry, Lily probably shot Woodworth um, and uh, Chomley slash Jack, uh, probably premeditated and uh, set the boat on fire and rode away. And had the, had the cook on board uh, the fishery, the cannery tender, the Lumi Bay, not seen that flash of light in the distance, which looked like a fire, and alerted his captain, he probably would have gotten away with it. Um, it wasn't the direction the Lumi Bay was headed, so it wouldn't have naturally come across this. And it didn't, didn't stay on the surface very long, it sank. So it could have just been one more of those cases where people died and nobody knew what happened to them, but they did. So, if you haven't heard, and I'm sure you have, <laughs> Betsy has uh, produced a book on, by, uh, uh, published by Epicenter Press called Forgotten Murders from Alaska's Capital. It isn't just Juno stories. We have cases like this which involve other parts of Southeast Alaska, a serial killer who killed in Petersburg and a few other places likely and a few other cases. Um, Old Harbor Books is, is out of them. Uh, very nice they did a book signing and was sold out. Uh, we'll be selling books that we brought over with us after the show if you want to. Also, um, if you think later about this, and this is our commercial, we do have a website called truecrimealaska.com. That's kind of our brand, uh, if we have one. Um, and you can, there's information there about where you can mail order the book. But we always support people going to their independent bookstore locally. And uh, if it's not in stock, see if you can order it. And you probably could, other than getting it from us. Um, anyway, at this point, we get Betsy yeah. back up and see if you have questions. Awesome. So, thank you. Uh, awesome. Uh, I thank you. for commerce and activity and the territorial status of Alaska uh, during that time. But how do we understand this true crime in a larger context? Well, that crime like this rampant? Were loners then as now attracted to Alaska? What are we making yes. of this? Yes, yes, very much. Were. I mean, the, still, there's folks that come up and drive to the end of the road and walk in and camp. But um, Alaska is a place where a lot of people were trying to get away from life down south. They're simply looking for an opportunity they didn't have, was here, and that included a criminal element. Um, uh, and sometimes, in some of the cases we've looked at, it's sort of more an opportunity to be a criminal. Uh, maybe that they didn't have before with such little law enforcement. But in cases like this, as, as Betsy was telling you about Lily, uh, he was a killer. He was a killer before he came here and didn't seem to be too worried about the consequences if he killed again. Um, in terms of, of where this case fits in to the economics, it was essentially uh, people would be very clever about figuring out where there was a need for whatever they thought they could pull off. Woodworth was an entertainer. He thought he could make money by going out to canneries in the small towns, putting on entertainment, which they simply didn't have other than gambling and drinking and occasionally prostitutes. Um, does that answer? Well, I, I, also, I also should note that when we did that over, overview of murder in Juneau between 1900 and 1960, we came up with somewhere between 80 and 90 murders that were labeled as murders. Now, I know that there were deaths that were occurring that were not defined as murders, but in those days, in territorial days, if there was any kind of suspicious death, they would call a coroner's jury and a federal marshal, 
and they would convene and they would look at the, hopefully the body in sight, the place where they were found, and talk to witnesses and determine the cause of death. Um, did, does that mean they missed murders? I think probably yes, a lot. Um, and I, I mentioned at the book reading the man who supposedly killed himself by slicing his throat and then closing up the knife and putting it in his pocket. And that seems a little unlikely. So, um, so, so I don't think our, our numbers of 80 to 90 murders within that period of time is accurate, but certainly um, there was a formal process to investigate the suspicious deaths. So certainly there was a percentage that were being picked up. Was it a really deadly place and a deadly time? I don't think so any more than most places at the time, given especially the lack of any sort of investigative skills on the part of police, who almost all were hired through patronage. So, you know, the mayor's cousin happened to become the chief of police, perhaps not too surprising. And what kind of training might that person have? Probably nothing. So it's not surprising at all that, that uh, given that lack of investigative skills and training, there would have been things that would have been missed. Great question, though. Anybody else? Oh, sure, go ahead. Um, so I assume the answer is no, but I was curious, so was the gun not checked for missing rounds? You know, this is so funny, because Ed and I were just talking about this. Now, in fact, what I said to him is, when did they start talk checking for gunpowder residue? And my guess is, again, it's, it's now been days, two or three days anyway, um, since, since the time he was picked up in the boat and the time he's brought into jail. So, so even if there had been gunpowder residue, it wouldn't have existed at that point. But so far as we know, there was no checking to see if there were missing um, shots out of the gun. So That's a really good question. That is a good question. And it's like I say, something we were just talking about today. Because yeah. we're planning in um, April doing a story on doing a presentation just on forensic forensic capacity or lack thereof in early yeah. Juno. Anybody? Was, oh, go ahead. There was, you know, during this whole time, there was no DNA. People didn't keep it, there strands was of DNA. Hair. They just didn't well, know what it was. They didn't know. <laughs> But, and, and I don't, I don't think this is particularly accurate. But the first reference to fingerprint use in Alaska was 1936 in Ketchikan, where the newspaper announced that, you know, bad men that beware. That was the headline: Bad men beware. Ketchikan's taking your fingerprints. And, but why? But and why? Was, of there's course, no, there was no database. There's no database. So the fact that they have their fingerprints. It means they're automatically never going to commit a crime. I don't know. I don't get it. And why are only the bad men are all in Ketchikan? Because that's where they stop on their way to, yep. you know, they stop there to get fingerprinted and checked out to see if they're bad men, and then they can continue on. And it's, it's pretty funny. Any any other questions? Yeah. I have the same. I have Yeah. Good for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was really intrigued when I came across the witness saying he thought it was Chomley's gun because I thought, well, that's interesting because it's the only piece of evidence that we tie Chomley to any of this. Otherwise, he's literally just a disappeared man who disappears again. It's rich. So, and I thought there is no way he would have left his gun. There's just no way. A Luger in particular. So it was not, you know, this was a pretty recently purchased weapon, I would imagine. Anybody else? Where was the last stop for, um, where was it? Ed's going to look at his notes. <laughs> that, that, that's, his, that's his part of the story. I don't even have to know it. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> um, the last stop that, that the uh, sea breeze had had, um, yeah, I think it was Little Port Walter, but let me double check here. I know at that stop, apparently, yeah. um, a witness later testified that he asked for to buy some whiskey, and um, Wentworth had gone over to this big barrel and just pulled out a bottle. Um, so I'm sure there was a lot of alcohol on board the boat, which wouldn't have done anybody any favors. Where was it? Um, Did you find it? No, actually, I didn't. I know where the. I mean, we we knew this. I just don't have it written down in the Sorry. Notes. Sorry. Sorry. But it was. Um, I thought it was Little Port Walter. I thought that's where they took. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, they took them there. Well, and I think that's why. And we know where the Lumi Bay had been going. Yeah. Um, but anyway. Uh, sorry. Sorry. 
failed you. You, you can. It's eat. in the book, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can get a copy. Of yeah. We we shrunk Anyone down some else? of the content. <laughs> Sure. That the sister wrote to the. Uh huh. How long after the trial had taken place? Uh, not too long. No, it was, it was just a month or two, I think. And yeah. she actually wrote several letters. This woman mm -hmm. obviously had the same need for attention that her brother did, because her letters were quite dramatic about mm -hmm. her failing father's health and how he had made it back just in time to say goodbye to him before. We don't even know if any of that was true. <laughs> she also claimed to be a songwriter, mm -hmm. as did Wentworth. Although from Woodworth. what Woodworth, but from what we can tell, Woodworth's songs that he claimed to have written were actually written by other people. Yeah. In fact, he something I find humorous is in very ref, various references with interviews from the musicians and stories about them and advertisement. There's a song called "Welcome to Baby Lamb." That's an odd name, but whatever. Um, which Woodworth claims to have written. Jack claims to. I'm sorry. Um, Lily. Lily claims to have written. Uh, they would both. Um, Lily, as he was being pretty much anywhere in custody, if they let him have his guitar, he'd sing that. There's a front page article, I think was on here, about him entertaining mm -hmm. his fellow prisoners in the small jail in Juneau. Um, and we looked it up, because I really wanted to find that song. <laughs> somewhere, somewhere. And I couldn't find anything credited to either of them. I found another song called Welcome to Babyland, which was by somebody totally different. Um, so I I don't know. I mean, it certainly was possible that people used. Seems a little unlikely yeah. somehow. So, but yeah, yeah, he would he would claim credit for things that he hadn't done. But who would know? Yeah. There was no internet. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and they seem far away. No far away stores. from other places. Yeah. Anything else? Oh sure. What's your most compelling story from your perspective? Of uh, the stories that we've done? Yeah. I would have said that first serial killer, um, the guy who was sentenced three years prior to this. Having said that, um, that was what I found the most compelling in the book. But since then, Ed and I last year did a whole new set of presentations that were totally different from the book. And I came across the story of another prostitute death, actually, at Douglas, that turns out to have been part of an international white slavery ring which was absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. So um, right now, that's the one I'm really immersed in, I guess, uh, because we're really spending a lot of time working on um, researching that story and some other ones. And, and so you'll have to look for the next book. But the, the serial killer story is really, really interesting to me because like all these murders, they have been forgotten. When we bring this story up in Peter Petersburg, they might know about it. They're still talking about this guy in Petersburg, apparently. But in Juneau, um, when we bring up, do, does anybody has anybody heard these stories? We always get a no, always. So, um, so that's one of the things I find really, um, I find really lovely, actually, about bringing these victims alive in a way that they had just disappeared. So that's been. Yeah. Really and there's lovely. a phrase used a lot these days, uh, say their names, and that's what we're doing. Yeah. Um, and we, we have tried to do a lot of research into uh, missing and uh, murdered indigenous women, which mm -hmm. of course is a, um, an issue, and we talk about some of those folks in, in some of our tours and presentations. Yeah. That didn't work in here. Yep. Anybody else? Sure. So how long have you been doing this? About five years. And what, 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 how did you um, I, I started reading about the Birdman of Alcatraz. How many of you guys have ever heard of the Birdman of Alcatraz? Yeah, this is, by the way, an older generation thing, I have to tell you. Uh, the Birdman of Alcatraz became very well known in the 1950s because of a best-selling book followed by a best-selling movie. But the Birdman of Alcatraz's first crime was in Juneau. And when I found that out, I thought, well, that's interesting. And so then I just started reading and doing this research and then doing this whole spreadsheet and then just spending way too much time. So, what was so his first um, he, killed, he killed a man who had um, cheated his prostitute. He was a pimp in Juno. And um, what's interesting about that story is that the book and the movie fabricated the entire reason, his motivation for killing this man. The real reason he killed him is because he told his girlfriend, the woman, the, the prostitute, 
um, he t said he would pay her $10 if she spent the night with him, which in 1909 was a lot of money. Um, and she spent the night with him and he gave her a buck. She went to her uh, pimp, this 18-year-old guy named Robert Stroud, and said he cheated us, killed the Russian, gave him the dollar, he bought bullets for their gun, went and shot him. I mean, shot him point blank in the head oh, in, no. his, in his cabin. And both in the book and the movie, this is portrayed as he had a girlfriend who was a dance hall girl who was savagely beaten by this man in Juno. And so in her defense, he went and sh got into an argument with him and the gun accidentally went off and he accidentally killed him. My, my favorite part of the false story is that he supposedly, the person he killed, had ripped the locket off the neck of, of the girlfriend and it had the picture. The really, only picture. The only picture she had of her daughter. Which is completely made up. Yeah, yeah the whole, the, so, so it was, so that was really, really interesting when I read this and then started realizing there was this, inc in fact, today, if you looked up Wikipedia, that's the version of the, yeah. what you're going to read because that is so commonly accepted that he was avenging the death of his yeah. girlfriend um, that it is still in common parlance that that was the case. And Ed and I, when we looked at the uh, newspaper stories at the time, des she's described physically, the woman is described because she was also arrested both of them charged with first degree murder. And in her physical description, like two days after the crime, there's no mention at all of any kind of bruise on her face, any sort of evidence of any kind of beating. So, so. No locket. No locket. No <laughs> locket. <laughs> so the whole thing was just completely fabricated by an author who I think didn't want to write about prostitution. It was the 1950s. And um, wanted to create this much more sympathetic character. Mm. Which so, did. Long, and, long, long answer to your question. <laughs> no, it's a good, and the thing is, if anybody's interested in Birdman of Alcatraz, who didn't actually have birds in Alcatraz, they were in Leavenworth. Yeah, when sure. he was sent to Alcatraz, they got rid of all the birds. Yeah. But he, um, there's an awful lot written about him. There's videos and documentaries and all these people who think they're experts and most of the information is wrong. Because it's based on that mm -hmm. same book. There's a, a woman who did the real investigation of this and went through every damn thing the guy wrote and he was prolific. Every court record and just painted a picture of this super heart creepy psychopath <laughs> yeah. and, and pedophile. Yeah. Um, who was Wannabe this? pedophile. Because remember he was, he was in, in jail, jail most of, the time. Most of his, all of his life after age 19. Seven, 19. But there were opportunities yeah. there. So. Yeah, that's true. There were. So, so um, so anyway, The Many Faces of Robert Stroud is the book to read if you're really interested in this. And it is actually, really gets the whole story. So long, long, long answer to a question. I promise our next answer will be that long if there were. All right. Okay. Oh, sure. Just one more real quick. When you opened with the, uh, the photo, the mug shot, uh, where when, at what stage of his career? Lily, that very early photo, uh -huh. that was his arrest at Folsom. That was his California arrest. When So both those arrests, the mm -hmm. first one, the youngest one, is when he was arrested for manslaughter and the second for larceny. But what's interesting to me about those two photos, when you juxtapose it with the photo from the warden's card, is he has that same, like, completely disinterested, sort of eyes at half mass look, no matter what age he is. He does not look like a nice character, ever. So, yeah. And unfortunately, I think Betsy mentioned this, there are no photos of Woodworth, at least yeah. we've been able to find. <laughs> Newspapers in those days didn't have the ability to reproduce, to take and reproduce <laughs> local papers. Uh, I mean, local, local photographers yeah. without great technical, I mean, they have to send was, whatever they had off somewhere else. And have it processed yeah. and then mailed back, so they just didn't do it. And sometimes I found, I found pictures of family members through Ancestry.com, but I was not able to with this family. So... I think that's it. Thank oh, you. One more oh, question. sure. One more? Yes, one. Sure. Go ahead. Oh, if I may. Um, so I understand that you guys have been working various beats for a long time, and these murders happened a long time ago. But is there any sense of that the two of you have of secondary trauma from working through all this, or do you guys uh -huh. go happily to bed every night? <laughs> You know, I, 
when we first started doing the walking tours, they were pretty much vignettes. They'd be these short little stories, and oftentimes there'd be like an interesting little bit to it that was just made it intriguing or interesting. But then when I started actually working on the book, or when we started doing these more in-depth presentations, mm -hmm. it is much, much harder to live in this space for a week or two weeks or three weeks, as long as it takes. And um, and so it's definitely harder the more time you spend at it. And luckily we're retired. So whenever we feel a little overwhelmed, we take the dog for a walk. <laughs> or we visit our grandkids. Or we, or we come over ducks. here and see our aunts. <laughs> <laughs> or we look the, at the ducks out the window. So life is good, <laughs> despite all of this. So thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.